cancer is something that everyone, no matter what age you are, will have to deal with in one way or another in a lifespan. No matter who you are as a child or an adult, cancer is something that you will touch. It will become part of you at one moment or another. Not necessarily, I'm not saying you're necessarily going to get cancer. I'm saying that most likely someone close to you will get it. You will know someone who will have died or you will know someone who has had to have chemotherapy and or radiation or a mastectomy, anything. What are cancer's biggest issues? As we saw in episode one, funding is a major one. But to resolve the funding issue, we must build awareness and create political will. The question is, do our politicians care enough about cancer? How about researchers? Do they care enough to collaborate? Or are they busy fighting for funds? In this, the second episode of Cancer Is, we will also look at issues facing patients directly, including screening, treatment, and palliation. Too many enter their final days in agony, and often alone. This is now true in developing nations as well. Cancer clearly knows no cultural, geographic, or socioeconomic barriers. As many nations develop economically, they are inheriting many of the cancers associated with highest income nations. Lung cancer, for instance. Indeed, lung cancer is now the world's leading cause of cancer death. And without intervention, tobacco could kill one billion people this century. Do we have the will to stop this trend? The political will? Let's find out. So everything happened to you in one week. I mean, you went from Soleil normal to Soleil cancer patient in one week. Yes. Did you know what cancer was back then? No, I had had my mother's best friend had died of cancer years before. For me, it was a cancer of old people. Um, young people did not get cancer. I didn't have a lot of experience with it. The only people I knew that had it were of the older generation. Cancer and cancer prevention and control should be on the health agenda of every country, every state, and certainly the G8 um, uh, agenda, even though it isn't as I speak. You've got tuberculosis, you've got HIV AIDS, you've got malaria, all important diseases. But cancer kills globally more people than all of those put together. If you look at the uh, strategies, national health strategies of many countries, especially in Eastern Europe and some of the more middle income countries, you see that they have put the chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases as priority, and among them cancer. There are some countries like Thailand, for example, it has cancer there on top as a major disease to fight. The donors have not developed the same understanding yet. There isn't enough attention paid to cancer and other chronic diseases at the present time, both in the high income, but particularly in the low income countries. We've got the low income countries, you know, striving to, to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, which are wonderful, wonderful. It's galvanised unprecedented levels of activity to help the one billion poorest people on the planet. But there's no mention of cancer. There's no mention of other chronic disease in that. I think that we definitely have to make sure that our politicians, both in the United States and elsewhere, realize that these health care issues actually are incredibly important. The one thing that the AIDS uh, activists have done and did very well in the late 1980s, early 1990s, is actually get HIV AIDS on everybody's agenda, make the politicians realize this is a concern of the populace. We need to do the exact same thing with chronic diseases such as cancer. It's too big a problem to ignore. It is too big and too frightening a problem. It is a pandemic and it cannot be ignored anymore. This is going to far outweigh many of these communicable diseases. And until we have strategies to deal with cancer, our lifespan could go backwards. I'm not angry at any of the organizations that do not currently engage in cancer promotion or understanding. I am more concerned about the people who, don't, who do not apply pressure on them to do so. Large agencies of government are not creative. They only implement, and sometimes badly. Sometimes they do a good job implementing. But 
they will only change direction in the middle of a great sea. If you look at it, each of these organizations is a great ship, and they turn in a wide arc. They don't turn suddenly. And they only turn when the currents are so strong that they need to turn. Funding for cancer services, specifically, or medical services, health services in general, is still very little. We are talking about $10 or so per person per year. I'm always impressed when I go to the United States and I see the tremendous enthusiasm of some charities to raise funds and to raise millions of dollars. Uh, in the UK also there is this cultural tradition. Uh, it's not the case, I'm afraid, in um, other European countries where this culture doesn't exist to the same extent and where it's a constant battle to get funding. The great tragedy in the U.S. right now is that the funding is level at a time when we're making great advances and so people are going different routes. And so the, I think the money needs to go into bringing in, recruiting the new talent into the fields and retaining them. Because when funding levels out um, and the field is growing, the people who are already successful get funded and the newcomers don't. And so they leave the field. Every year we organize different activities to um, get funds to do our job because here come a very many many people that don't have money to buy their medicines. Famous uh, restaurants in Brussels uh, offer a table of uh, for 10 persons one evening and the, the, we sell the tables um, 2,500 euros and the donors don't know what, in which restaurant they will go that evening. So the, the, the evening starts with a reception in uh, the city hall and uh, during this reception the, the mayor draw the the tables and um, it's only at that moment that um, the donors know in which restaurant they will go that evening. Because I've treated so many people in the country, uh, I'm often in a position of asking them for support in terms of philanthropy to the cancer cause and have been reasonably successful in that. A patient of mine who had uh, cancer uh, 12 years ago and she's now cured and she's thankful. So one day we were talking and I said, I, I, you know, I would love to be able to build a center in Val de Bron that would take care only of patients with breast cancer. That would be nice, that would be um, a, a place that people would feel well treated and that would be wonderful. And she said, what were you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about, you know, an important center uh, and I said, well, how much would that cost? He said, well, it's going to cost this. I said, okay, uh, I'm going to help you. And I said, well, and, uh, I said, I'm sure. And what do you mean you're going to help me? I'm going to pay for it. Uh, so this center is paid in full. A couple of years ago, a, um, a very generous Australian by the name of Mr. Greg Poach um, un came, came to understand what the importance um, of melanoma to Australian society was. Uh, and so after various discussions and some um, considering um, a variety of options, uh, he has um, committed uh, and some $40 million to help us develop a, a, a new centre which will provide all those things um, in one building. So one man is funding $40 million Australian dollars to one cancer Unit. It is a very um, important uh, contribution. It's, um, it's uh, the, the largest um, gift by an individual um, to a single cause um, in Australian history. I think increasingly I feel part of a global cancer community in that none of us in isolation can conquer cancer working on our own. Yes, I, I believe very, very strongly that collaboration is a key word if we want to win the battle against cancer. We are learning uh, 
been in touch with many of uh, doctors, many of uh, centers in uh, such countries, but also we have many contacts with less developing countries. This new tumor bank that you're putting together, which is fabulous, it seems to be, it will be very rich in content because of the genetic diversity of Brazil. Is this something that you will share with the world? Is this going to be an open bank or is this going to be something just for Brazil to use? Uh, the, the purpose, the objective it is to, to, to take this uh, tumor bank as a, a, a contribution of Brazil to, to do uh, worldwide cancer control. To the credit of the American Cancer Society and its heritage, we've always said if we were to solve the problem here but lose the rest of the world, it would be a very unsatisfying victory. So we have a growing commitment. Uh, we have active programs now. We've trained over 500 scholars, we call them, individuals from 80 different countries over the past five years, making some 200 tobacco control grants in different parts of the world. We need to collaborate and we need to be not too competitive between uh, centers. I think collaboration is absolutely essential. If you, because nobody can do it all anymore. You, the, the, the days of the, the, the lonely scientists working late at night in the labs, we're all working late at night in the labs, but we can make basic advances, we need clinical samples, we need new drugs, and so it all takes assembling a team together. And, and I would say that the most, by far the most successful researchers are those who can, who know who to go to for the next experiment, for help with the next experiment. I think patients wait too long um, because patients are afraid by cancer. For cancer, certainly uh, it's only in the few metropolitan cities where you might have opportunities for screening. And at the best of times, it's very low. Cancer screening is provided by the local government, but the participation rate is very low, between 10 to 20 percent. To me, if you screen and you don't treat, the best thing is not to screen at all. That's why a visual inspection with the acetic acid is very appealing in our circumstances because you treat immediately. And treatment is using cryotherapy. Cryotherapy is something that you can use without needing electricity, without needing uh, specialists. Basically what we have to do with screening is uh, teach or educate our, our population so they can do their screening at the moment they have to do it. In our area, just to give you an example, women get a letter and a video, uh, and a video, and uh, explaining them uh, exactly, and they are called, you should come to Valdebron uh, or call for an appointment uh, because you are due to do that. So we check our population. Cervical screening, the best way, recommended way, currently in the world is to conduct a pap smear. Now the Department of Health has a progressive policy which says all women over the age of 30 are entitled to three free pap smears in her lifetime at 10 year intervals. The problem is less than 20% of South African women have ever gone for a pap smear. That's what happens here, that's, that's what the people think, you know. I prefer not to know what my reality is and then when it's too late I cannot postpone it because it's so big that I cannot hide it. We are trying through health education to educate the women about the importance of self-breast examination and uh, the importance of just having medical checkup or coming out for a screening test. Do uh, women around us here in Peru uh, get a pap smear as regularly as they should? No, unfortunately not. The group that does get the pap smear is the group that don't have really the very big risk of cervical cancer. We have very many activities. Some of them include mobile units where we go and find people in their places to do the pap smear there. We have a regular program with the general practitioners. Once every three months, we bring them to the cancer center and we, we, we offer educational courses for them on cancer screening. Access to early detection techniques is critically important. Uh, one could make the argument uh, that every cancer at one stage in its development is curable. Now, it may be tr true that we can't find some of those cancers early enough yet, 
but we can find many of them early enough now that they are essentially curable, treatable, and you don't die of that at primary lesion. Uh, the one screening that is especially successful is the opportunistic screening done by general practitioners on pap smears for cervical cancer. So we have this uh, uh, urban outreach program, as we call it. Uh, nearly 150,000 women were accrued in three clusters of slums, 10 clusters of slums, where we only uh, empowered primary health workers. We taught them at the hospital uh, to do clinical examination of the breast and a visual uh, inspection of the cervix. Is there a future where cancer is less painful? I think that our ability to control pain has improved dramatically just over the last 20 years. We have patches available that uh, give narcotics that we did not have before. I am tremendously concerned that those drugs are not available to everybody. If one looks just in the United States, in uh, urban areas, uh, poor areas with high crime rates, the pharmacies don't carry narcotics because they're afraid that they're going to be robbed. If one goes overseas, there are countries that don't allow narcotics to be sold at all. The thing that is so troubling in some of these countries is there's no pain medication. There's no more painful way to die than cancer. I think we could do more for a patient for pain control, definitely. For example, we are right now innovating a, a home unit. I mean, the doctors are starting to go to the houses of the patients that cannot come here because they're in a very bad shape, you know, they're very, with a very advanced disease. So that's one thing we are doing right now for them. Uh, sometimes we have problems with the drugs because, uh, unluckily, uh, pain control basically moves around morphine, and morphine is a very controlled drug, so we have some problems with that. I think sometimes your mental pain can increase your physical pain. Um, but I've suppressed the physical pain because it was more the emotion and the mental pain that I had to, that I, that I dealt with. Um, the physical pain was more so the blood tests the getting blood taken, the pokes and the prods and the, and the actual, when they, you know, stuck 150 needles in my backside in order to get my stem cell, in order to just re-inject <laughs> it into me four weeks later. Uh, when I was actually coming off the morphine, I thought to myself, I'll never ever take morphine again because it took me three days and I felt like I was an addict. It was very hard to come off. It was probably, and again, very emotional, very mental. In a country where uh, opioids is used by normal people around the, around the country very, very openly and freely, it's actually illegal to, to uh, dispense morphine without having the permits. But when you travel into Southeast Asia, I mean, you go to the Philippines, or you go to Vietnam, you go to Thailand, uh, the drugs are much, much less available. Some, some of it is due to the laws. For example, um, in the Philippines, you have to um, write uh, controlled drug prescriptions on a special pad, and then the doctor has to personally go to the Ministry of Health to buy these pads. You have to pay for them. And uh, there's only a certain amount allowed per prescription, and usually it's spelled out in how many milligrams, irrespective of what the daily dose the patient needs and so on. So many different barriers. Is there a black market that is erupted? Yes, I mean, uh, all of these are drugs of abuse as well, and uh, you can get hold of them um, in, in, on the black market. And some of our patients know how to, how to get, get them. For example, for the Buddhists, um, it's very important for uh, certain Buddhists to have a very clear mind at the, end of, um, at the end of their life because they believe that the very last thought must be good and it will have a bearing on where you reincarnate in your next um, existence. So for those patients we have to titrate our opioids very accurately. As a doctor you're obviously very sensitive to palliative care. Are Albanians dying in pain right now of cancer? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. This is an reality in fact. Uh, if you'd asked me what the biggest uh, breakthrough was in, in the 90s, 
of the last century. I would have said anti-emetics, anti-sickness medicines. They actually made the quality of life of patients uh, so much better. They completely got this nasty chemo thing under control. No question about that. And they made a bigger impact than all the new chemotherapy agents put together. Even health professionals have phobia in use of morphine. We call it morph, morph or, or, um, or opiophobia. In that even when it's available, they would not prescribe it. So you have patients suffering pain unnecessarily. That's incredible. So what, what do you use? They use aspirin or paracetamol. That's the only thing that is available for them. So there are a lot of people screaming. Exactly. If you have a lot of pain and uh, uh, the only thing you have is aspirin or paracetamol, I don't think that would amuse you at all because you take it but it wouldn't touch the pain. Clearly there are many people in the world who are not the beneficiaries of cancer prevention or treatment and they die miserable deaths because of pain and, and incredible suffering because of the lack of appropriate narcotic analgesics and the fact that importation into some countries is prohibited or that in some countries where it's accessible it's essentially pirated off and not available to individuals who are suffering is an incredible problem and uh, one for which there are solutions and it's not the lack of availability of the drug it's the lack of distribution of the drug and and similarly there are there are parts of the world africa in particular where palliation by radiation therapy is also a rather forlorn hope at the moment. The amount of mm, discrepancy and the amount of uh, different uh, levels of care in cancer around the world is, 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 is dramatic. Um, and then when we look at the quality of care, we see that poor people especially are less likely to have good quality of care compared to the middle class or upper middle class. It's not as much a race-based thing as it is a socioeconomic thing. The problem is that a larger proportion of black Americans or African Americans are poor compared to white Americans. Does this get you angry? It does. It does. Uh, you know, all human beings deserve good care. And it's obvious that in the United States and in a number of countries, uh, there's tremendous disparities in the quality of care. Give me some solutions. Give me some ideas. Transportation to the doctor or transportation to the clinic can be a tremendous impediment to getting good care, even though that good care is available and it's free. Uh, in my own practice, I've seen people who have not only difficulties with transportation, but once you get them that transportation, they tell you, I can't leave the house at the same time every day to get radiation therapy, because if I'm seen leaving the house at the same time every day, my apartment will be burglarized. With the whole history of South Africa, the apartheid healthcare system before 1994 meant that very few Africans or people of color had access to the early detection services and education, but also treatment services. Now that is changing, and we've got leading oncologists and professors at the public institutions around the country. However, the problem is the access, especially for the majority of people living in the rural areas, to get to those treatment centers, and also for uh, you know, early diagnosis. There are no infrastructures of cancer centers. There, are no, there aren't enough physicians, oncologists, diagnosticians, uh, nurses, midwives. Uh, there aren't any of those sorts of resources in most underdeveloped countries. It's frustrating. We get calls all the time in our office from children in you know, needy countries or developing countries that just don't have access to even treat you know, what is actually a very curable type of cancer like a retinoblastoma or a Wilms tumor and we know that those kids will die and they don't need to. I think that the key um, in, in the developing countries to solve the problem are prevention, early detection and training. I'm looking forward to one day when the global community would uh, find means and mechanisms of having the prices of these uh, vaccines affordable to the people who really need them because 
it's the poor countries that need the HPV vaccine more than the rich countries, but it's the rich countries that are, can access the vaccine. 80% of cancer patients in Africa never have treatment, they only have palliative care. I think we're in a poor country, we have very many needs. The diagnosis in our country, cancer diagnosis, is very severe. We suppose we have about 36,000 new cancer cases per year and only 12,000 reach to some sort of a diagnosis and treatment. That means only one in three. We would love to have help. So you think that the international institutions at present do not sufficiently support low resource countries in the field of cancer, of course. I couldn't say that. I could say that maybe they don't know what our real needs are. And if they knew what our real needs are, they would really try to help us more than they have done right now. Here in Peru, there, are, there is only one in Lima, no? But in, uh, so six months ago, we built and created this institute, and it's so beneficioso for all the people of the north of the north. No? They had to come to Lima, and they had to stay here uh, at least 30 to 45 days to be treated because cancer treatment is not uh, a treatment that takes only four or five days. Cancer treatment takes at least 30 to 45 days. Uh, so uh, we started to uh, see that the answer to help all of the Peruvians was to decentralize the cancer the treatment. The chemotherapy you can have in some of the um, smaller urban areas, but the radiotherapy is in the main metropolitan areas. So in order to assist that access process, we provide these homes where out-of-town patients can come and stay for free, and they get room and board, nutritious meals, and transport to and from the treatment centers on a daily basis, as well as the moral support uh, of being with, with staff and, and other cancer survivors on their journey to recovery. Uh, the access to the patients, to the institutions, is a, it's a very hard access, especially in these areas, on those areas, uh, like Amazon or Central West of Brazil. A gentleman who walks in every Friday, he meets our medical social worker department and he just uh, adopts patients and he just gives, uh, 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 just takes care of all their needs, you know, in terms of financial needs. Every Friday he walks into the hospital and he adopts three patients. I don't know him also as a director of the hospital, I've never met him, he doesn't want to meet me. He just meets our social worker and takes care of whatever the financial needs of, of uh, three patients every Friday. Unknown person. We regard the patient as the patient and his or her family. That's who the patient is. Because we know there are good scientific data, as well as it's the right thing to do, to involve families in patient care, both in the treatment, aftercare, and for survivors. Uh, so I think there's no question that it's, we're talking about uh, a package when we're talking about um, a cancer patients, the patient and their family. I remember myself that when I was trying to um, uh, create a, a support group for, for a group of young widows with young children, um, we had to find an excuse um, for them to, to get together. In my particular case, they were fundraising for the local hospice, and so they thought that they were doing um, something, a project together that's helpful. Um, but really, we were sort of bringing these people together who had many things in common. And they became fast friends and they continue to support each other many years afterwards. Tata, it's very vibrant. We have large, uh, we have, I think, about a dozen um, uh, groups, individual groups of volunteers who come in and who are very much a part of our hospital. I've, I've, been, I've opened up my doors, you know, any volunteer wants to come in, they're more than welcome. Uh, doctors are extremely busy. We have huge numbers of patients to deal with. You can hardly talk to them. And the volunteers can really be uh, your right hand and your left hand there to support both the medical people and the patients. So first they were the wives of the, of the doctors and then other ladies, friends of them, were interested. So they started to, you know, recruit a lot of uh, women and now that we have about 700 volunteers in the hospitals that do a lot of work and help us a lot with the patients, especially with the patients. 
they give the warmth to the patients. That's very important. Because sometimes the doctors, unluckily, don't have time to, you know, to, to be very warm with them. But then they come, the ladies, and like angels, they help them a lot. The love that we give to the patient and the satisfaction that we have at the last of the day because we do something for someone who needs it. And this is the more satisfaction that we have, more than all. The most of the volunteers here have 20 or 15 years here. It must be hard to be so close. We are humans, yeah. and many times we have to go to the office to cry, and then go outside and continue our job, because have many times that we broke. Because this, the cancer is a very bad thing. Every village uh, you have the hair volunteer. We use this hair volunteer to promote the campaign about the breast cancer. We teach them to how to uh, do the good breast cell examination. I was trying to face the cancer to say, you will not get me. It was my way of dealing with what I was going through. That I would put those... Um, I went to a... A tattoo artist who specialized in henna, and I asked him to put a big henna sun on the back of my head. And I went into the hospital actually to get my my uh, when I was going to get my stem cell, and I walked in with a big sun on the back of my head. And the doctor said to me, "You know, you shouldn't have gotten that because we don't know what's in henna." And I said, "Do you know?" that the toxic that you're putting in my body right now is not going to care if I have henna on the back of my head in the shape of a sun. And that was it. And he just looked at me and he continued to give me my treatment. Overall, in Spain, are we winning the fight against tobacco? Uh, we are. Um, but the, the fight against tobacco is not uniform. Uh, it depends a lot on the communities. So, for example, there are some uh, uh, autonomous regions in Spain, such as Catalonia, where we're doing extremely well. The local government is working very closely with the central government, and tobacco is being banned, and there are also campaigns against tobacco, and so on and so forth. But in some other sites, this is not happening. In Madrid, for example, uh, the restrictions on tobacco use are much looser than in Barcelona. There's no reason now why we should have cigarettes on the market. There's none at all. There is no safe way for an individual to use tobacco. If you smoke cigarettes, you get cancer, cardiovascular disease, there's 24 ways it can kill you. If you smoke a pipe, there's still about 10 different types of cancer that can kill you, even if you don't smoke cigarettes. If you chew tobacco, you get cancer. There's no safe way to use tobacco, none at all. So why is it still on the market? It seems to me to be crazy. You have the problem of young children today, as young as six years and seven years, uh, being handed out small pouches, uh, which are very cheap, which have different forms of, uh, of tobacco. It's called gutka and pan masala. Some have less tobacco in it, some have a little more. And uh, children as young as six and seven years get addicted because it is an addiction. And uh, it creates a lot of pre-malignant changes in the mouth. Uh, something like uh, which no other ethnic group has. It's only the Indian ethnic group have, which is called submucous fibrosis in the oral cavity. And their mouths don't open. They have trismus, their jaws lock. They can't eat, they're in miserable condition. And we expect these young children who today are addicted, within the next 20, 25 years, having huge major problems particularly with cancer. So it's going to be a huge epidemic in the younger, uh, younger people in their 30s and early 40s who are going to emerge with major head and neck problems. Tobacco is probably the world's largest killer drug. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. It probably kills more people than heroin, by far. By far. Mm -hmm. So if Tobacco we're in Western countries is the single largest preventable cause of premature mortality. 
you want to die early, smoke. So one of very important things that Brazil needs to advance is the, um, the increase in prices and taxes over tobacco products. The cigarette, Brazilian cigarettes are the, one of the, uh, the cheapest in the world. So we need very strongly to advance this process because the World Bank recommends an increase in prices, taxations and price as one of the most efficient strategy to decrease smoking among adolescents. So are we losing the tobacco battle completely in India right now? Well, I, won't, I wouldn't say we're losing. We have a government today who is most proactive against the tobacco lobby. But it's difficult to beat the tobacco lobby. But for once, we have a very, very proactive uh, government and health ministry. They are after them. They're trying all sorts of things. They've got legislation passed in parliament, which I think very few countries have had it. They, they've signed all the treaties, all the WHO treaties. They've had it ratified in parliament. Uh, he's banned, uh, the, the health ministry has banned advertising. Surrogate advertising is creeping in through the back door, so they're trying to get at them. Uh, they're trying to stop celebrities from smoking. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, you know, one step forward and three steps backwards, but not for lack of trying. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and I will no longer say that word, I will say FCTC from here on, is the world's first public health treaty. Uh, we've had plenty of other treaties uh, dealing with, uh, with issues such as landmines and children's rights and so on, very important, but this is the first public health treaty. And it really provides a roadmap for every country in the world as to what they can do to reduce the burden of tobacco disease in their country. Is it working? It's beginning to work. It's very new. It was, the negotiations began in 1999. They were concluded initially in 2003 when the World Health Assembly unanimously passed it. It then went out for ratification. And to date, more than 150 countries out of 192 member nations have uh, ratified it. The U.S. is regret regrettably not one of the, uh, those and, uh, more than 150 countries. What we need to work on now is implementation. I never thought bars in Ireland would, uh, go, no, uh, would go non smoking. I never thought I would see a day when uh, one couldn't smoke in a cafe in uh, France. In the U.S. state of Maine, uh, in our northeastern corner, uh, a law was just passed within the past week which will require no smoking in cars with children under the age of six, 16 years old. Um, and it's a very practical law because uh, we know the U.S. Surgeon General has said there is no safe level of exposure to tobacco use. Children are particularly vulnerable to secondhand smoke, to the smoke of others. It increases bronchitis, it increases ear infections, it uh, does many things that, uh, that affect children. And so if you get into a car in, in the state of Maine anymore and you light up a cigarette, you're, you are subject to a fine. Smoking kills 440,000 people in the United States every single year. That means 1,200 a day, 50 an hour. But since 1963, we have been able to decrease the prevalence of smoking from almost 50% to 21%. That is huge. Why? Because we are preventing hundreds of thousands of deaths every Sorry year to inter Go just ahead. by tobacco control. Sorry to interrupt you. Is that a global trend now? Are we winning the tobacco battle worldwide? Mm -hmm. No. No. China, Unfortunately yeah. not. Other countries. The tobacco industry one of the most irresponsible industries in the whole world. They know very well that they are losing business in developed countries because of tobacco control activities are very strong there. And they're moving towards weaker economies and weaker uh, politically speaking countries because they can buy anything they can. There are, there are over 60 carcinogens and carcinogens cause cancer in tobacco smoke. When tobacco smoke is examined in the laboratory, you find six, over 60 carcinogens such as nickel, cadmium, formaldehyde, benzene. All of these are proven by the United States Food and Drug Administration, um, EPA, the uh, WHO, and each one of them causes cancer. And unfortunately, they're all in tobacco smoke, both naturally and added by the tobacco companies in order to increase flavor.
We have information that Mixit, which is a, a youth method of sending SMSs through their cell phones and inviting people to join their groups, was actually started by the tobacco companies as a way to reach the young market. The other methods that they were using, the tobacco companies, were in, was to invite people secretly to parties through emails and through, through um, secretive kind of invitations so that there was a lot of intrigue and daring element to it which appeals to young people and then once they would get to those parties it would be all you can drink and all you can smoke um, which is a way to get young people hooked on the disease we've also found sorry a way to get young people hooked on the this deadly habit we've also found that young people at universities have been paid to give out cigarettes. Not only are we not trying to be friendly, we never have been friendly. And in fact, they are probably the prime enemy. They're the vector in this disease. It's really, that's the, the only way to describe them. Uh, they are a legitimate business and it's very difficult in that sense to uh, come up against them and say, you know, you can't do business any longer. We don't have that ability. But what we can do is say that they are the purveyors of disease. We know that if cigarettes are used and tobacco is used in the way it's intended, it kills you 50% of the time. Well, still, uh, cigarette smoking is obviously uh, the uh, highest uh, factor for cancer in Japan. Uh, well, 27% of the cancers uh, in both sexes are attributed to cigarette smoking. 39% in male and 5% in female. In 1912, a physician in St. Louis rushed up to the dormitory where his residents were, brought them down in the middle of the night because he was going to show them a very rare disease. It was called cancer of the lung. Lung cancer virtually did not exist in the United States in the early 1900s because people were not smoking cigarettes in the way they do now. Last year in the United States, nearly 200,000 people died from lung cancer. We go from a rare disease to our most common cancer killer. And the only connection between the two is the fact that cigarettes have increased exponentially since that 1912 when those first cases were being, where those first early cases were being seen. That's one. The other is we have enormous number, over 50,000 studies looking at the physiological causes of cancer from tobacco. And there is not a shred of doubt, not a shred, that tobacco use causes 15 types of cancers, not just lung cancer, but 15 types of cancer. It also causes heart disease and also causes lung disease. It's become very trendy, especially among university students, to smoke hookah pipes, or it's also known as hubbly bubbly. And it's very common in the Western Cape, um, but it's spreading throughout the country. It's seen as a kind of cool way to smoke, a cultural experience, but as you know, it's very, very dangerous, just as dangerous as smoking cigarettes. We also have the challenge of snooze. It's not as popular as it is in Europe, but it is growing in popularity. So there are all these ways we've got to fight the, these habits that are trying to be, are marketed as trendy and cool. So we need to, to really push that it is not cool. One of the things I'm also passionate about is uh, the way a lot of our TV shows and movies have smokers. And we're trying to get this stopped and get regulations in place, but it's a big, big challenge. Because, of course, millions and mil millions of people watch movies and TV shows where people are smoking, and they get influenced by it. Raising taxes and raising the price of cigarettes is probably the single most important thing that can be done. Uh, right now, um, cigarettes in a good bit of the world are uh, Western cigarettes are out, of the, are out of the price range of most people. On the other hand, very cheap cigarettes are available, and that's what uh, people smoke in a good bit of the world. For instance, in New York City now, the price with the new tax law in New York is going to go up oh, close to $8 for a pack of cigarettes. So that's uh, roughly five, uh, you know, five euros. And um, it's... Eight dollars, you said, yes. for a pack right. of cigarettes? cigarettes? And that is effective because in New York City, 
the rates of tobacco use have plummeted since the city really went after the, um, the tobacco, not tobacco users, but going after tobacco by having smoke-free, a very strict smoke-free law and increasing prices. So governments can be very effective in doing that if they do it across the board, if they do it on a consistent basis, and they also offer counter services so that if you're going to drive people towards stopping, you also need to offer cessation services. The two need to be paired. We've been working since 1987 with the schools, and we've had a, a good progress. We did a survey in 1987 to ask the students under 15 years old if cigarette smoking was dangerous. And only about three to five percent said it was dangerous. Also, over five or percent or so said they thought it was dangerous, but 90 percent plus thought it was nothing. It was a, a social issue that was punished because it was for adults. And that was the idea. Ten years after, 90% know it is dangerous. And most of them, about 80%, say they speak in the houses, in their houses, saying, Daddy, don't smoke, you're going to die. In the Socially now, because uh, the incidence of tobacco smoking has gone down so much, a lot of people are no longer used to the smell of tobacco smoke. And, and there's um, people who, who, who now smoke are frowned upon. And, and the, the rest of the people who don't smoke, which forms about 85% of the population, get quite irritated by those who do, which is a good thing. Very angry. Uh, the tobacco industry, big tobacco, is an immoral industry that basically puts profits over people's lives. Uh, tobacco in its production and distribution is the greatest weapon of mass destruction the world has ever seen. And the numbers of people that it, uh, are harmed by it dwarf um, literally the number of people that were adversely affected by all the wars in all of history. So when you look at what they're really doing, they're actually drug pushers. They're out there addicting children, knowing full well in advance that children are more easily to addict than adults. And then they have these lifetime customers whose lives um, who half of all of whom are killed by the product, uh, uh, who use the product throughout their whole life. It will be not fair we, if we will be acting against smokers, okay. biologically dependent people, because they are not smoking because they choose to die from lung cancer. They are dependent. In tobacco smoke you have nicotine, nicotine which makes you a way of smoking. Uh, obligatory. We must do something with tobacco. What, make it less cancerous or get rid of it? I, I think we have only no, two well, choices. It's not possible to make this less cancerous because it's, there was many, many ties. So we must... Get rid of this, it. We, this is what we say. Uh, tobacco fail what? This is what we must looking for. Should the world be eradicated of tobacco? If we would like to be eradicated from lung cancer. It seems that our leaders need to pay more attention to cancer. They need to turn cancer into national and international priorities. Fortunately, the cancer community is working together to get cancer on global agendas. The community is also collaborating on basic and clinical research. It's working to exchange knowledge and find solutions. Yet we're losing too many of our loved ones to cancers that could have been prevented or treated successfully. And too many suffer without pain medication. I cannot forget Dr. Ngoma, his comments about terminal cancer patients using aspirin as a painkiller. Our challenge is clear, to fight cancer together. Today we know more about cancer than ever before. We understand many of its causes. We know how to prevent it and we increasingly know how to treat it, especially in its early stages. This significant growth in knowledge must allow us to succeed in stemming the growing burden of cancer. The gap between what is and what could be in global cancer control must be resolved, particularly in lower resource countries. The time for effort and solutions is now.
cancer kills more persons than malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis together. So that definitely has to bring cancer into international agenda right now because we are really having an epidemic of cancer.